Thank you for being here this evening. Wow, we have a crowd. This is great. Um, why don't we just get started with this? In the summer of 1986, um, I was working at the shops, and I was directed by the supervisor to go over and to, to that's okay, that's okay, son, to go over and um, clean out what was known as a blueprint room. And we were to take all of the blueprints that related to the shop, related to the repairs in the shop, the rebuild of the locomotives, and um, pack them up and send them to Chicago. Because at that time, at that particular time, we had sold, uh, sold the railroad to where it became eventually VMV. So one of the questions that's always been outstanding with this is, why did they build the shops here at Paducah? Why build it at Paducah? Why not build it at Fulton? If you look right here, Fulton is more the center part of the railroad. You have five ways you can go out of there. You can go from Fulton to Chicago on the main line, up the Edgewood cutoff, go to Paducah, Louisville, the line down to Jackson, uh, Jackson, Tennessee, Birmingham, and on into Miami, Florida, and then the one on down to New Orleans. So why would we want to build a shops that's off of the line? Well, I think one of the reasons is because of water. That shops required a tremendous amount of water. And there was also a, a kind of a myth going on, possible myth that um, maybe it was because the city fathers also give an attractive, gave you an attractive offer. We also had a hospital here, been having, we had a hospital here from a long, long time. And, uh, one second. Let me hesitate. It was built sometime around 1899, and uh, they had some extensive improvements in 1904 for about $20,000, they said. And it was one of the finest hospitals uh, here, or finest hospitals on the railroad until 1917, and then it burned. So they built a new hospital. Um, built a new one, and it's still on Kentucky Avenue. If you drive down Kentucky Avenue, you'll see it. And that one was sold to Catterjohn, to George Catterjohn in 1957. But in 1935, I had my tonsils taken out there, and it cost $5. <laughs> you can't get that done now. There was already a shop here in, uh, in, back in those days, early shop, because on a notation on this, um, this particular picture, those two locomotives head in, did a head in on it, and it was 1903. And so they brought them into Paducah, already kept them coupled together, and brought them in and had them repaired. They even had a band here, and the band was in 1918, about 1918 for the, for the band. So it was, um, they already had a railroad established here. Now this is a panorama that was made in 1923 by the George Saker Company. And they made this panorama prior to building the shops here. And if you look, I have the individual shots, and you can see some of the materials, uh, truck sides that they had. Am I? Did I? Okay. Hey, open field, and also some of your old automobiles there. Uh, if you look right over on, uh, look right over at right corner, you'll see a horse and buggy there that they use for transportation. And that was the old Washington Junior High School. How many of you remember Washington Junior High School? Well, that's where it, it was located, and on around, uh, there's the roundhouse. They had a 36-stall roundhouse here. And it was interesting about that roundhouse, whenever uh, I was dating, or as we used to stay in old days, sparking my wife, um, I told her, I said, I served my time there. And she looked at me kind of strange, you know, I said, well, it didn't have anything to do with, this, with, uh, with being in jail. I said, I just served my time as a machinist there. So everything's okay. We got married, been married about, for about 30 years now. Well, let's let the work begin. And this was a swamp out there. It was gullies, terrible place to work. So what they ended up doing is putting, uh, started driving pilings. And there's a team of mules that, that they used to drag the pilings around. And another team of horses for the pilings. And after they, of course, after they got them driven and they had to cut them off, 
and check them. There's some of them. And with the, the tank shop, excuse me, boiler shop in the back background, and there's some more that they're checking for a height. This is one of the buildings out there that they were building. It's not quite finished. Uh, this was a powerhouse. And the powerhouse uh, had several boilers in it that they used to make the steam. And it had, uh, you can see part of the framework there for it. And also those exhaust stacks. Those stacks were 278 feet high. And that's about two and a half times the, uh, the height of the Citizens Bank building down here, what was the old Citizens Bank building. So they were very, very tall stacks. Um, inside the shops, there were the boilers, and they're putting the boilers together, assembling those to where that they can uh, uh, start making the steam. These are, this is what's known as a firing plate. It's about down in the boiler where they could put coal in there. It's all coal fired. And uh, then heat, heat that steam, heat that water, and make that steam. There's some more of the flues that the water lines, that the water ran in to do that. Now, these, this is a shot of feed water pumps. And the feed water pumps were, uh, were used to supply all of the water for the boilers. This is part of the area behind the storeroom that they were building all of this construction. And this is the blacksmith shop. And you can see they did a lot of, lots of construction. Whenever I get down a little bit further, I'm going to talk to you about this part of the part of the boiler shop. If you'll notice, there's no glass in here in these transoms yet. And what they would do is put open those up during the summertime and uh, let the heat out of the shops. This is some more of the shop being built. This is inside the uh, truck shop, not sorry, inside the boiler shop. Uh, we have some shots here of the blacksmith shop. They're starting to move, uh, move two parts in there and move uh, tools to work with. This is part of the pipe shop. And in here we have a machine shop with some large slab millers in there. And another shot. Now this high base shot here, that was known as a riveting tower. And what they would do is actually stand boilers up in the air. And they would uh, rivet those together, put them together. This is part of the blacksmith shop. You can see all of the hammers that's in here. And another shot of the pipe shop. And this is a machine shop, of course. And this is part of the machine shop in here. This was the erecting side. If you, if you look at the shops, and I'll show you a picture a little bit in the future, the erecting, the erecting shop had three bays. And this was uh, the bay where they actually put the, the locomotives together in this area. There was a 250-ton crane up here and also a smaller crane. And they had pits they would bring the locomotives in down here and pick them up with that crane and move them all the way down here and then start working on them. We'll see a lot of that. This was a bunch of the, the um, sewer lines that was put in, and I will give you specifications on everything in just a few minutes, but that's the sewer lines that they used. This is an overall shot of the shops during the steam engine days with the roundhouse here, and then there's those three sections of the machine shop, and then the boiler shop, and then they had a tank shop over here, and then back in here was the powerhouse. In order to test the locomotive after they got through, they uh, put a steam engine on that 250-ton crane and picked it up to check it. Now, I don't think those men are standing under that crane. <laughs> I really don't. But anyway, they wanted to show that. Whenever they finished the shops in 1927, they had this really, really big celebration. And it, I wanted to play you a little piece of music that... Uh, that was written especially for that, for that occasion.
in the front of the building, uh, they had markers, had, had some markers from the Commonwealth of Kentucky, and these have been moved. They are down at the Paducah Railroad Museum now. And uh, they explained about uh, that Charles Markham was the president at the time, and that's the reason the song was dedicated to him, and it, it was really a, a big affair for them to be here. And uh, Paducah Shop, some of the specifications, I'll run through those. It, shop, it covered 110 acres, the whole shop, and that was under glass. And uh, excuse me, 21 acres under roof, I'm sorry. 21 acres under roof. Eight acres of glass was used, which is several thousand square feet. They used six million bricks, six and a half million bricks to build that shop. Eight and a half miles of sewer, fire, and water pipes. 9,700 tons of steel was used. 16 miles of track. 15 overhead cranes, and they had overhead cranes from anywhere from 10 ton to 250 tons. Two concrete stacks, I mentioned those a little bit before, 278 feet high. They were 44 feet in diameter and lined with 185 feet of uh, brick, fire brick. Had 12 miles of overhead pipe anywhere from a one inch type to a two foot pipe in diameter. 60,000 barrels of cement, 625,000 cubic yards or 44,000 carloads of dirt for fill. That's how bad it was. And they used uh, sand for the floors, 1,350 carloads of that. They had 24 oil storage tanks over there for 192,000 gallons. And one of the things that's fascinating, they had 175 automatic telephones in there. They had their own telephone system, had their own switchboard and everything. And you could not call out on any of those phones. You couldn't do it. They were all internal. This is a picture of one of the blacksmiths. He is actually hammering on a frame of a steam locomotive, a steam engine. They, act, they built the parts over there for the steam locomotive. And this is where we're, they're trimming one, cutting it to size. This is an automatic cutting torch. And they would make little templates out of lead. And it would run along and it would actually cut, uh, cut this, uh, this slot in here. Here's a boiler that's being rolled, getting ready to build one. There's one that they're hanging the firebox on the boiler. This is different sizes of, uh, of boilers that we've ended up producing. This size, a little small size, and of course a very large one. Here are a couple of oil makers that are working on the side of it. They're probably working on some stay bolts. And these bolts, there's an inner shell and an outer shell on that boiler and the water runs in between it. And they have these bolts that separate it. And whenever one of them becomes broken, then it will leak water. It'll leak water out of little portholes. And you'll be able to see it so you can go in there and replace it. Here, these are flues. This is what the, the smoke came through, the heat came through to heat the water in a boiler. This is a series of locomotives that are in process. This one, of course, is frame. And now we have a boiler setting on it, and now we actually have it setting on the wheels. This is what you would see if you go down to the 1518 on the river and, and ever get an opportunity to go up in a cab. This is what you'll see. This, this is the inside of a steam engine. And whenever I was an apprentice boy, we had to go in here. This is a firebox, and this is what's known as the butterfly doors. And we'd open those doors and throw some 2 by 12s in there and crawl in there with steam and heat in there, they'd close the doors, and then you'd scrape the back of those fire doors so that they'd work freely. That was Prentice Boy's job. Yeah. Oh, yes. And then this is the front end of the engine, and uh, your smoke would come up through here. These are flues, and they'd have also have units, what's known as units in there, and units were just nothing more than big pieces of pipe running the length of the boiler, and what it would do is heat the water twice so that you would have superheated units, and that would raise, that would dry out the heat and give you more pressure. A couple of the supervisors looking at the progress of the locomotive. That's a 250-ton crane in the, in the machine shop. This is a picture of uh, them boring brass out for um, a using a vertical boring mill. 
And what they would do, what these boxes do, they sit on the wheels, and that's actually your bearings. And they would lubricate them, of course. These are connecting rods, and they machined all their connecting rods over in the shops. Uh, there's some laying on the, on the floor. This is a picture of one of the machinists actually milling one. And um, they, they, they did a tremendous amount of machine work there. This is a valve that come out of a steam engine, and what they would do is take this, take this and pistons also, and they would weld them up, and then they would turn them again, put them in a lathe and turn them. And the reason they did that is because they could save a lot of money without having to, without having to replace them. This is a set of wheels, steam engine wheels, and what they're doing, they're turning this surface right here. And there is what's known as a steel tire that goes on that surface, big ring. And you'd put a heating coil on it, gas heater. You'd expand that tire and you'd drive it on here and you'd set the gauge between these two pieces, between the two wheels. And then that way the locomotive would run on the tire rather than running on a wheel. There's a set of wheels that are ready to go underneath a steam engine. If you'll notice, there's your tires that are on there. And that's another set. And this is a set which is with those boxes that I mentioned that had, uh, that have already been bored and been fitted to those axles. This is steam, of course, another steam engine. It's, it's, it looks like this one might be tearing down to work on. This is kind of interesting uh, shot here. This was a set of um, scales that uh, the railroad bought. And that would weigh up to 450 tons. And what they would do is put the, every locomotive across those scales to make sure they had the exact weight and it was balanced. This is one where one of the machinists is, is machining a, a wheel for a tender. And this one, he's, he is actually turning some wheels. And this one looks like a little later, it was probably for a diesel or probably for some work equipment. This is a set of trucks. And these trucks will go underneath the tanks or the tenders. And they completely rebuilt those here. We have this whistle, and this whistle, uh, I have been trying to get, get a hold of that whistle and find somebody that can blow it. Because that whistle is a very interesting part of the railroad. Anybody that was here during the time that whistle was, was being used, that whistle ran Paducah. That whistle ran Paducah. They would blow it at 6 o'clock in the morning, then they'd blow it at 10 minutes till 7, and at 7, and noon, and 3.40. And then everybody set their watch and clocks to that whistle because that's railroad time, and that was the correct time. 1937 flood. Um, I have a transcription that I will play for you and, of the flood, and uh, I, I think you'll find a little enjoyment out of it. My name is Frank Walter Ryan. I want to relate an incident that happened the great 1937 flood at Paducah, Kentucky. Long in the 1st of December, it, it started raining again, and it rained constantly. Well, every day and every night, the full month of December. Well, the river was had begun to rise some, but uh, they had been floods before. There was one in 1911. There was one in 1913. And uh, people didn't think too much about it. Uh, they just thought it was another, that it would quit after a while. Well, it didn't. Well, in the first part of January then, it, uh, it come a hard freeze and ice and snow. And uh, the water be had begun to rise up underneath it all the way from, from uh, here to way up in Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, all up the Ohio Valley, all the way north. The boss come around and what few men that did get in to work, he put us all to sack and sand and uh, they was gonna try to sandbag around the IC hospital to, to try to keep the water out of there. They had a lot of patients over there. That was over on Broadway and uh, 
they put all of us to sack and sand, and then they'd haul it over there with a tractor. Well, uh, that was, it done begin to get dark, and uh, so uh, we sacked sand into way up in the middle of the night, and all I had to eat was what I had took in my lunch. Well, we eat that up at the regular supper time, didn't think but what we'd leave at the usual time. Well, when 12 o'clock come, which we, at our quitting time, law me, the water done got so high we couldn't get out of there. So we we stayed the rest of the night. The foreman stayed with us. <clears throat> and uh, next morning, it just kept on getting higher and higher and higher. And uh, so uh, they took us all over to the powerhouse after a scene that we couldn't save the hospital. So it took us to the powerhouse to see if we could keep the water from going into the to the powerhouse so they could keep heat over to the hospital. Well, we went over there and sacked some more sand and sandbagged all the doors and everything, but law me, that was a that was a hopeless situation. You couldn't keep the Ohio River out of as big a place as that. So uh, we stayed all that day there trying to keep the water out of the powerhouse until it it got to coming real fast there along at the last and it was just impossible to keep it out so we went up on the second floor and uh, that was on saturday that was the next day well uh, they had a bunch of lumber up there and stuff and so some of the men decided they would uh, build a boat and go over to uh, down there about two blocks to livingston's wholesale house to get some food we was beginning to get hungry so they made a, a boat and went down there and we could see them through the window they loaded up a lot of provisions and, and uh, but they made a mistake of putting too much in there and they got out there and one of them currents hit them <laughs> turned the boat upside down and spilt all the food well <laughs> they uh, come on back and dry it off and they decide to go again and they went again and that time they they did get back with some Vienna sausage and potted ham and stuff like that and I know we cut it open with our pocket knives and eat it without any crackers or bread or anything but it was good because uh, we hadn't had nothing in a pretty good while well it got night and the next day was Sunday well, uh, the next morning then, they got a boat in there from Mayfield and brought uh, two five-gallon cans of milk and some eggs and bacon, and we had a pretty good breakfast there that Sunday morning. Well, in the meantime, I had, it had been, the thought had been striking me of how I was going to get out of there. So uh, I seen these steel drums floating down beside the powerhouse, so I decided to get one of them and get straddle of it like riding a mule and ride out of there. Well, uh, that wasn't practical, so therefore I didn't do that. But the next day, no, no that night, why, I talked to a couple of ballermakers, Roy Holston and Fred Duff, and we decided to get three of them and build us a raft, which we did. We, we caught three of them and... Uh, got some lumber and wire and chain stuff and we made us a raft and the next uh, we waited till the next morning which was monday but anyway we got uh, we got our raft made and we all three got on it and uh, we made it in triangle shape and one one over each barrel and uh, then we got some poles to push out so we had all had a big long pole apiece so we maneuvered that it was very hard to maneuver the doggone thing. So we maneuvered it around, got over on Kentucky Avenue, and uh, as luck would have it, the current was going out. So we went out Kentucky Avenue, two blocks there, pretty, pretty period. Here come one of them Coast Guard cutters down 21st Street there, boy, just parting the water every which way. And so uh, he slowed down to stop and said, hey, you guys want to... You want to ride out of here? And I never heard such welcome words in my life. And I jumped up and just practiced screamed. I said, law, yes. I said, get us out of here if you can. 
So he sidled up there, and we, one at a time, got out and got in that Coast Guard boat, and he took us to 27th and Jackson Street. Mr. Frank Ryan, um, 1942, excuse me, July 27th, 1940, they had a safety celebration here at the shops. And the reason for the celebration is they had worked 2,326,098 man hours without a personal injury from a period of July the 10th, 39 to July the 10th, 1940. And it was, they decided to have, have themselves a party for it. In April the 24th of 1929, everybody had safety shoes. Everybody on the whole shop wore safety shoes. And they, we were the first shop on a system to do that. And this, this, this thing that we had was a happening. It was, this party that they had was a happening. Um, they had an all day affair out at uh, Carson Park, had a horse and dog show, let's see, had uh, several speeches. Mizzy, Mrs. Roddy Peoples was there with her Pajuka band featuring the Tucky sisters. And uh, later during the dinner, our Harry Ware orchestras played and, and played God of Us America and a floor show by Crystal Smith Studio. They had barbecue, hot dogs, hamburgers, uh, cold drinks, and ice cream, and it was all free. So they had a big, big celebration then. This picture here is very, very dear to me. That gentleman standing right there with his arms crossed is my dad. And this was at the celebration. This is one of the more famous pictures that a Chicago photographer took of working on steam engines and pulling them up and up in the air. And uh, some that are finished over here. This was the rebuild line for steam engines. And the steam engines were finished down here. They'd start here with their bare frames and work on down. And then they'd end up finished there. Paducah had the unique, uh, unique bill ability to build locomotives. Oh, I'm sorry. And so back, they built 20 uh, Paducah built locomotives. They were mountain types. The numbers were the 2600, 2619, and they built them between 42 and 43. They cost $60,000 in 1943, and all of them had been retired by 1960. They had 70 inch drivers, which means these were 70 inches tall. They had a 28 by 30 inch cylinders, 270 pounds of boiler pressure. The weight of the engine itself was 424,000 pounds. Had attractive effort, 83,160 pounds, and 26 tons of coal, and 22,000 gallons of water. This is kind of another unique locomotive. It was 1146, and the hostler was bringing it across the turntable to bring it in the roundhouse. And what happened was he failed to turn the air pumps on, so he had no air brakes. And came through there and ran through the roundhouse uh, and ran out on Kentucky Avenue. I can barely remember that. Dad brought me down to see that. But they brought it back in, and they started decorating it up. They put some flashing on it. Show you this picture. And what the reason they did make this, like the pasture engines, or pas not yeah, pasture engines and passenger uh, coaches, is because they ran this locomotive between, uh, between Fulton and Louisville and back. They put diesels on there at one time and ran them up there and ran them back, and the coal miners stopped them would not let diesel engines go through. So they said, well, we'll come back and we'll decorate one up. And, and that's the only, only steam engine on our railroad that was ever decorated like that. They also did repairs there. This is an unfortunate repair of a GP9 that uh, did a head on, did a collision in, in Mississippi, down in Mississippi. This concrete block was shoved back against the cab and unfortunately there were fatalities there. But those people in that shop were absolute craftsmen, and they had ability to rebuild that one back. And that's what it looked like after it came back out of the shop. This is where the steam engines were being dismantled. There are some 8,000s that are in, in a line ready to go through to be cut. We get into the rebuild era, and uh, that was the picture of the shops that was on the front we started. They did away with the boilers over in the powerhouse and bought Cleaver Brooks package units and uh, which they used for their steam. They also refitted it with new machines. This one is a Lucas Precision Boring Mill, and what it did was it would bore out the bottom part of where a cylinder liner set for a power assembly. 
And what that, and they started using C liners instead of B C liners. I, I, I hope I'm not too technical, but they used used the C liners instead of the B C liners in order to eliminate water leaks and water going down into the crank into the uh, crankcase. It also had the ability to clean up this exhaust stack area. This is a 20-cylinder engine. It's the only 20-cylinder engine on the IC railroad, and it was in a locomotive 7,000. This is a traction motor which hangs on the wheels that actually runs the locomotive. Most of the locomotives are, are diesel electric, they are not mechanical, and they have a generator that, uh, that the engine produces, <laughs> the engine uh, turns the generator which produces electricity that goes down to the traction motors and that's what turns the wheels. This is a shuttle machine where they're cutting uh, where they're machining a traction motor to go under there and an armature which would go in there just like the old armatures that we had used to have in starters and generators many years ago. There's some that are ready to go on in. This man is cutting a commutator on a, on a main generator where the brushes would set to pick up electricity to run it. There's a main generator that's ready to go into a locomotive. These are high voltage cabinets. This is what switches and let you go forward or reverse, depending on which way these are turned. Now, what they did in the later years, they used electromechanical, electromechanical switches and eliminated all those. This is a machine that I really liked over in, in the shop. And what it does, it, um, it nibbles. It nibbles holes out. It has 27 different punch and die sets and a carousel. And it would pick it up and shove it in there and it would nibble it out. There's a picture of it nibbling. And you would, it was programmed to do that. This is a picture of a rebuild line of the, of the uh, parts lines. There's some engines down there that are being assembled. This was all power assembly area here where they were tore down and cleaned. There's his 16 cylinder engine ready to go in. Whenever he came in, they'd strip them down to the frame, locomotives to the frames, and they would take them out and sandblast them. And then they would bring them back in, they'd start through the line. This is an older picture of the line. But actually you can see a bare frame here and then they're starting to put things on there like traction motor blowers and then on up even to put the engine on there. And as they move down these pits in that erecting shop, that's where they would assemble everything. There's a cab that uh, it's been rebuilt and it's one of the few that has a bullfrog nose on it and has gyro lights. And it's also a round cab, which they went to a square top cab uh, down the road. There's one being set. That's a tire, tire locomotive being moved on a 250 ton crane. It will go down and we will move it over to another shop and then they'll put the long car body on it. In fact, they're hanging one there. This is what runs the engine. This is your uh, console and you'll have your air brakes here. This is the uh, air brakes for the engine, air brake for the train all your gauges and everything. Now, if you want to move it, what you would do is put a reverser handle in here, shove it forward, push up what's known as a main gen uh, the generator field switch, let your air brake off, okay? And then you'd blow the horn twice if you were going forward, and you'd pull out on the throttle right here, and it would move the locomotive. You stop. If you want to reverse it, put your reverser in reverse. You'd blow the horn three times and pull the throttle out, and it would move it. You'd also ring the bell. Make sure your bell's ringing. One thing that's kind of unique about this is all of these parts, all of these cutouts, including these little bitty slits and everything for the switches, that was all done on that trunk machine that I showed you previously. So they could program it to do that. This is a set of trucks with the traction motors already in, uh, ready to go underneath a locomotive. These are air compressors. Uh, that's what would, would build the pressure up on your engine. This is a air cooled, that's a water cooled. And uh, eventually they all went to the WBO water cooled. They talk about the first locomotive that was built at Paducah shop. And they talk about the 8109. Well, 8109 was the first GP locomotive, but the very, very first locomotive was the 200. Now the reason for the discrepancy between the 1200 and the 200 is that this locomotive's picture was made after the Western Lines was sold to, to the Chicago uh, Central Railroad. 
and they ended up retaining the green diamond. But this is the very first one. And it was uh, SW7, 200 horsepower, and it was 1,200 horsepower. It was a 12-cylinder engine. This was the first GP10. It's a, the 8109. And they had a big celebration whenever they put the GP10 out. And there's its specifications. Uh, remanufactured from GP9s. And they either put the 567C engine in it or the 645C. The 645C had larger cylinders. And it would give you more horsepower. This is an old GP, uh, GP8. It was a GP7 at one time. You'll notice it has a round top cab on it. So this is an older one. This is, it turned into a GP8. Uh, 12, again, there were 16-cylinder, 567Bs or BCs or Cs. This locomotive was kind of unique. That's the first GP11. And whenever they rebuilt that locomotive, they put a lot of, uh, a lot of new items in there. They put a central traction motor blower here. And there were a lot of improvements. And I spent a whole year tracking that particular engine. And the reason I tracked it is because they wanted to find out how many repairs that it would take how many, during that year. Well, it became so successful that they ended up making the GP-11s. They actually built the GP-11s. This is one of the GP-11s, and it's in a transitional paint um, era. What happened was they couldn't really make their mind what, they wanted, what color they wanted to paint these locomotives. So they painted, started painting some of them orange. And I, we ended up calling them the pumpkins. <laughs> this is the GP-11. That's, that was the final version of it. And it made, to me, it made a beautiful locomotive. There's a specification for it, the 8301 and the 8701 through the 8753 series. And they all, most of them had the 645C engines, which were which gave them the power. This is a switch engine. Uh, we, we rebuilt a lot of switch engines on there, and you can see some of them are marked Illinois Central. Some of them are marked Illinois Central Gulf after the merger. Uh, this one is an older one because of the round top cab and the specifications for it uh, with the C engines in it. And it was 1,300 horsepower. They raised the horsepower a little. This is known as a calf. They had what's known on railroads were cows and calves. And the calf was coupled to a switch engine. And what that gave you is more power to move the train back and forth without having to put an extra cab on there. So it was much, much cheaper to use those. And there is its specifications. They had uh, actually had three of them on the railroad. That's the latest switch engine. It had, of course, the square top cab, the flat cab, and all the improvements on it. Most of them uh, that came out had roller bearings. This one happens to have oil bearings on it. And uh, it was one of the early ones, and they did change that and put roller bearings on it. The 1400s and the 1500s. This is an SD20. This is the, one of the few SD20s uh, that they put out. But it has six, six wheel trucks under it. But it also has a 16-cylinder, normally aspirated engine. Now, whenever I say normally aspirated, normally aspirated, it means it had blowers on it that would produce air that would, so that you could run the engine. A turbocharged engine, on the other hand, had a turbocharger built on the back of that engine, and it put much more in there. What we need to understand about the engines on all of our locomotives only I see locomotives with an exceptional few of G's and Alcos, is they were like two cylinder or two cycle lawnmowers. Just exactly like two cycle lawnmowers. Every time that piston went up to the top, it fired. Your automobile, it's every second time. But these were that way. They were made with ports to where air would go in and blow the exhaust gases out. As the piston came up, it would go to the top. They spray a little fuel oil on top of it, fire, and come back down. And if you'll ever listen to them out on the railroad, they're some of the smoothest, quietest engines that you'll ever notice. And that's the SD20. They, 38 of them were manufactured, and these were manufactured from SD24s. Uh, I think they came off of uh, the Southern. A couple of them came off of the Southern. This one is kind of unique. This is a 2601, and uh, the 2601 was, uh, was a GM and O locomotive. 
In fact, it was GMO 502 and, uh, let's see, they did a 502 and 514. And what it is, it actually was a GP30 that they converted. Now, this one is a turbocharged because anytime you see a designation D3, that 3 indicates that it's a turbocharged engine. But this one's turbocharged, and it did have 2,250 horsepower. But they only made just, just a couple of those, 2601, 2602. Of course, this was kind of towards the end of the, end of the time for them. They did some advertising. These are a couple of the brochures that, that they used at the, for the Paducah built to go take to other railroads to see if they can sell some. This is some of the, the gifts that they would give. And then this was a patch that was specially designed for Paducah Shop and Paducah Shop Security. In 1977, uh, we celebrated our 50th anniversary. And there was a fellow by the name of uh, uh, Donald Leslie. I don't know whether you know the name Donald Leslie or not. He wrote uh, Gateway, Gateway to Paducah? Yes, Gateway to Paducah. Well, he, did, he made this suggestion to the city that they make an uh, auto tag out of it, a city sticker out of it. And then Mike Merritt, uh, over at the shops, he constructed this. And that's what the city sticker looked like for that year. They celebrated the, uh, our anniversary, golden anniversary here. Now, maybe I shouldn't be telling you about this, but these, over in the shops, they had craftsmen. I mean, absolute, total, complete craftsmen. And they were producing these coffee tables. And the coffee tables were about four foot long, you know, really nice looking coffee tables. And I was working over there, and of course I decided I wanted one. Well, I went to my supervisor, and he said, I'll tell you how you can get one. He says, you go, and says, you reprogram that Trump machine, that nibbling machine, where to where we can make these mailbox plaques that can hang under mailboxes. And he says, if you'll do that and get that in production, I said, uh, I will be more than glad to be, have you one built. So I did, and I went on and programmed it, and, and that's what, that was the result of it. And they, if you go out to, on Snyderman Road, between the tracks, on Snyderman Road, and look on the left at the P&L, where you go into the P&L, you'll see one of them that's hanging out there now. It's out there. We did a lot of work for other people, too. We did work for the Southeastern Michigan Transportation Authority, uh, for Ashley Drew and Northern downtown, or down south, and also for New Jersey Department of Transportation. We did some Amtrak work. We did Clinchfield Railroad with family ties. Now this one we did for the Massachusetts Bay Transit Authority for their commuter service. And here another, one well, of those problems came up and, and the men at the shop solved them. If you look right back here in the back, you'll see this little bump out. Well, it was kind of like building a boat in your basement. They bought this head in unit, this power unit, that would serve, that would generate electricity for the cars to have lighting on the cars and heat on the cars. And what happened is whenever they got it in, they found out it was too big to go in there. So they said, no problem. We'll just cut the, cut the side of this thing out and we'll just put a little bump out on it. And these are the only locomotives in the world that have that bump out. Conrail, we did some work for Conrail. Uh, Liberia American, this is a Liberian American uh, mining company. We did some for them. This locomotive was the very first locomotive that, uh, well, the last locomotive that Paducah Shop built, or not built, but Paducah Shop painted. Um, and what happened was they were going to show this, uh, introducing the VMV and, and the P&L Railroad. Well, as an ambitious photographer, if it sat there, I would make a picture of it. So about six or seven days before the big show, I got out there and got the pictures and already had them developed and was selling them before. And they were not pleased. <laughs> not at all. But we got that done. The timeline of Paducah shop was uh, uh, March 12, 1925, the ground was broken. And September 1st, we went into operation with 436 employees. Uh, the flood waters at 68 inches. How tall? How many of you are taller than 68 inches? Well, maybe you had two inches of water hanging out your head because 68 inches would just about get me. 
but that's how much water was in there. They phased out the steam locomotives in 1954. Uh, last steam locomotive was released in 58. And the work, they had worked on the shops completed uh, to do some repair on diesel locomotives in 63. That's whenever they went into their rebuild program. First diesel, 8109, that's the first Jeep diesel, was May the 5th. Uh, they put out 108 rebuilds on 1976. In 1980, they, had, they did 950 diesel locomotives rebuilt. Since starting in 82, the employment started declining. A lot of that was because of the economy and people were buying their, were, were not buying locomotives or they were buying locomotives uh, at another place from some other company. And then on August the 27th, 1986, the shops were sold to Jim Smith and to David Reed. Um, I was there on that last day. I walked out. There was about 27 of us that left that shop and the next day it became VMV. And uh, I, had, I had a wonderful experience at that shop. Uh, it, it was great working there, good place to work, good management, superb, superb craftsman. I can't emphasize that enough. I want to thank McGracken Public uh, Library and, and also to Bobby Rinko for, for permitting me to put on the show. Um, and I, I give thanks, to, of course, to Elmer Gregory and George Cashin, who were photographers at that time, and Douglas Arnold, who did our welcome to Mr. Markham. And thanks to Frank Ryan, may he rest in peace, for that little story about the flood. And that's it. Thank you.